Given the millions of billions of Earth-like planets, life elsewhere in the universe without a doubt does exist. In the vastness of the universe, we are not alone. If we go with the assumption that we're not alone, one question still tickles the curious mind. Have we ever been visited by extraterrestrial beings? Or rather, has the Earth ever been visited by them? Throughout human history, there have been numerous reports of UFO sightings and alien encounters. Some of them are purely based on interpretations of ancient texts, hieroglyphs and carvings. Some of them are what seem to be strange objects depicted in old paintings. Some others are claims of close encounters and abductions. And finally, some are official reports of such sightings by the US government. Even though none of those reports can verify that these objects are of extraterrestrial origin, hence the term unidentified flying objects, one claim among all seems to stand out. A story that began in the late 80s and has stood the test of time over the decades. And that is of course the story of Bob Lazar. Bob Lazar claims he was working at Los Alamos National Labs in New Mexico in 1982 when he put a jet engine in his Honda something that made its way to the front page of the Los Alamos paper. Years later, when he sent out resumes looking for a job, Edward Teller, who was acquainted with Bob back at Los Alamos, gave him a reference at EGNG. He went for an interview at EGNG Special Projects at McCarran Airport in Las Vegas. They gave him a job in the field of advanced propulsions at a remote area in Nevada, a place where Bob Lazar claims was located 15 miles south of Area 51, called S4, and it's the place where he had to reverse engineer an alien aircraft. Since the information that Bob had disclosed was supposed to be classified, he believes that his records at Los Alamos and the university he had studied at had been wiped. This would help the dismissal of his story by the news and reporters. But first, Let's see what he had allegedly seen in there. He describes the object as a saucer-shaped craft about 52 feet in diameter, cold to the touch, made of what he guesses to be some sort of an advanced metal or ceramic. And according to some paperwork he had been given, this object had to have originated from the third planet of the Zeta Reticuli star system. He divides the object into three sections, a lower section, a middle section, and a section on top. Having gone inside the aircraft, he mentions that it felt as if it was built for pilots half his size, if we can call them pilots. He also says that everything was fused together and all parts had been connected as if they had been melted like wax and joined with no right or hard angles. The only existing parts that he described were seats, a reactor and some subcomponents. No bathrooms, no artworks, and no decoratives. All in a single dark pewter color. As he recalls, in the middle section there was a reactor in the center, surrounded by three equidistant seats, and three equidistant large rectangular objects with no lights or buttons. He calls them gravity amplifiers. Also, archways were part of the superstructure, one of which could become transparent without losing its solidity, sort of like a screen. Under the gravity amplifiers in the lower section are cylindrical pieces which he calls gravity emitters. As he puts it, the reactor powers the amplifier and the output of that goes to the emitters at the bottom which then results in anti-gravity waves that can be directed and controlled with the movement of emitters. We'll get back to this section. There is also a level above which consisted of two sections and Bob assumes it was some sort of a navigational engine taking information from the surrounding area allowing the craft to orient itself in space. The center antenna being an extension of the reactor allows the emission of the gravity wave which embraces the whole craft. The gravity emitters can swing up to 180 degrees manipulating the gravity field around the craft and enabling it to move in space, which means if all three emitters were to be used, the craft would move in the direction of its belly. Did you know that if you talk to an alien, the first thing they would tell you would be to like this video and subscribe to Planet of All? 
listen to them. Just saying. Now let's see why some people think there is some credibility to this story. Back in 1989, Bob claims that the emitters in the lower section of the craft emitted gravity waves. Some say the term gravity waves had not been accepted back when Lazar mentioned it for the first time, when in fact the scientific community had already proved its existence. A concept that might not have been as popular in those days, yet had been predicted by Albert Einstein in 1916 and detected in 1974 by two astronomers. But if Bob was lying about his educational background, how could he have come up with such a concept? On the same note, how could someone with no education in physics or engineering come up with this and show up in the papers for installing a jet on this car? Despite the fact that Los Alamos officials say they have no record of him ever working there, George Knapp shows that a 1982 phone book from the Los Alamos lab lists Lazar right there among other scientists and technicians. Another piece of information disclosed by Bob was that the reactor incorporates a stable isotope of element 115, an element that had not been in the periodic table up until 2003, when it was synthesized for the first time. Not to mention the shape of the craft and how it moves. Also, according to his statement, no matter the load on the reactor, it never got above the ambient temperature, which is in violation of the laws of thermodynamics, or in other words, physically impossible. Here's how the craft disclosed by Pentagon over two decades later moves. That's not our LNS though, is it? It's also not. seems to defy physics as we know it, right? Also looks impossible. Yet another part of his story that adds to its credibility is that in spite of being ridiculed, he mentioned some kind of hand scanners that were used as a security measure upon entry in S4, which would measure the length of the finger bones that is unique to each person. Over two decades later, pictures of those hand scanners were published, proving Bob was telling the truth about the existence of those biometric scanners. Even though these tests are not highly accurate, it's still worth mentioning that Bob agreed to take the polygraph test on several occasions, where he successfully passed them. On top of all this, his story has not only remained consistent over the years, but has also thrived with the passage of time. Whether you think he's been lying or telling the truth is something that I leave to you. I am curious to know what you think about his story about UFOs and aliens in general. Do you want me to make more videos about these types of subjects? Let me know in the comment section and also let me know what you think of Bob. And if you'd like to learn more about his story, I strongly suggest that you check out his interview with Joe Rogan. And there's a documentary called uh, Bob Lazar, Area 51 and Flying Saucers. Check them out. Thank you for watching this video and don't forget to like and subscribe. I'm going to go and make more videos. In the meantime, if you're interested, check out these videos. Yeah, goodbye.